going to try to find out what they're actually talking about because they're not talking about reality anymore. And I got to warn you, this leaked video from our Canadian friend on synodality in Canada has got an extremely high cringe factor. But I'm not trying to make fun of the people. I'm trying to show you the absurdity of this. So here now is one Bishop Anthony Daniels of the Diocese of Grand Falls, Windsor, Canada, breaking down synodality for us. Now, the synod process originated uh, with the Second Vatican Council. The bishops of the Second Vatican Council enjoyed so much being together, being free to say everything that they needed to say, talk freely and openly, um, and know that there was a Holy Father who was really listening. And Pope Francis says that's what we have to be doing now. Now, a couple of Sundays ago, Bishop Daniels substituted this little video here for the Sunday homily in every church in his diocese. So this is as serious as a heart attack. Every child, every family, everybody had to listen to the video that you're about to see. I'll put a link to the whole thing so you can watch it and enjoy it. The bishop means business, in other words. Now, I know he doesn't look like a bishop, but near as I can figure, that's because, well, Bishop Daniels is listening. And these, evidently, are his listening togs. It's not enough to bring the bishops together and listen to what they have to say. We have to find a way to bring all the people. We have to listen because the church needs to learn and understand what's going on. How can we minister to a world that we don't understand and we're not listening to? So let me get this straight, Your Excellency, in all due respect. Even over the past 50 years, even since Vatican II, you can walk into any church in the world on a Saturday afternoon and what do you see? A priest in one of those stuffy little confessionals hearing confessions. He's been doing it for 50 years and he's doing it throughout the week. He's doing it before Mass on Saturday in the confessional. So I got a question for you, Bishop Daniels. What's he doing in there? He's not listening. What is he doing in there? How much more listening can you possibly even imagine that, that a priest would come and listen to individual pe penitents four or five times a week for 50 years? He's not listening? According to you, Bishop Daniels, no listening has been going on until Francis arrived? And, and then, and then your, your brother bishops, Bishop Daniels, same deal? For 50 years? Your brother bishops couldn't be bothered even to listen to their own flocks? What are you saying here, man? I'm not a big fan of Vatican II, the new bishops, the new mass. I gotta say, I, I, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't say that about all the bishops in the whole church, that for 50 years they were totally useless, so useless, that they wouldn't even listen to people, their own flocks. What else, Bishop Daniels, can we conclude from your statements here other than that Vatican II was, as we traditional Catholics say it was, a complete failure? The hope is that people will find their, this in a safe environment where they can say what they really believe, what they really feel and think. And our hope is that people will have a sense that we are listening. Um, I mean, I could never be more proud than if people who attended these meetings went away saying, I think they really heard me. I think they really listened. Now, not to, not to nitpick here, but, but what were you guys doing all this time exactly? What if you could tell us? I know you're saying you weren't listening, so what, what were you doing? I know you were hiding priests you know, who were diddling the kids. I get that, but that's not a full-time job. So you weren't listening. You weren't doing much of anything. What, what, what were you doing? Why were we writing checks? Why were people tithing for 50 years for a church that was this useless? And maybe more to the point, Your Excellency, in all due respect, remember, you started this. You're the one that put this video out. We got to respond to it. Question for you. Why, 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 would, why would anyone trust you? 
after all this? When you've been dinking around like this, according to what you just said, y'all have been dinking around, clueless about your own job, for 50 years. Why are we gonna, why are we gonna trust you? Even if y'all figure out how to listen, what are a worthless bunch of men, the ones you just described, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna be able to possibly do for anyone in distress when after 50 years, you proved to be so useless? <laughs> kind of a lot to ask us to give you a second chance, isn't it, Excellency? And you just didn't care about your own people for a half a century? Or maybe, Excellency, if we're going to start being honest here, maybe this listening bit that you keep talking about, maybe it's code for something else. The synodal way, and I, I hate using that word because it's such a strange word, but the synodal way is the Christian way. It's the way that Christians should come together to deal with important issues. It's knowing that what you say is valued and, and it's knowing that what you say comes from a place deeper than you in you than just your opinion. You're, you're hearing God in this. Ah, I see. The voice of God. The voice of God is telling us that we need to tell the bishops to change the church. I see. That could be. But then again, the Boston Strangler thought that his little voices were from God too, right? A lot of serial killers went around hacking up prostitutes in the big towns, you know, because they thought God wanted them to do it. So that's a little shaky, isn't it? You want us to just interpret our own crazy little inner problems with the voice of God? And if that's it, if God's just speaking directly through us, what is the point of the church, right? Now, I got to tell you, Your Excellency, I, I'm not really buying this. You seem pretty judgmental, guy. I mean, really, you seem pretty judgmental. Almost as if you're trying to vilify every priest and every bishop who came before you. Which naturally brings up the question, how far back do you want to go, Your Excellency? Does your condemnation of the church of the past, does that apply to, I don't know, maybe St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Augustine, you know, the, the doctors of the church who said what? Who said we're supposed to shut up and listen to God's word, to the Bible, to the infallible teachings of the church, right? To natural law. Shut up and listen. Guide your life by what God has already revealed to us, right? That's what I thought it was all about. Not the musings and rantings of dysfunctional people who want to be listened to because they just don't think it's fair. And no one's listening to me. That's an obstreperous little brat who needs correction, not more listening. Any father worth his salt can tell you that. Keep the commandments if you want to earn heaven. Now, that's a paraphrase of scripture, <laughs> Your Excellency. But do you remember who said it? Jesus. Was Jesus then also a, a bad listener, Your Excellency? Because Jesus was also the one who said, unless a man be born again of water and the Spirit, you remember? He cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, right? You got to do things in order to be saved. Jesus said, go therefore and convert all nations, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Commanded you. Nothing about listening. So what I'm hearing now is that there is that kind of evolution that says, we really want to hear what you think and what you feel and what you've kept cloistered for all of that time because it was never appropriate to say it. it you, you weren't encouraged to do any analysis, to do any thinking, to express feelings, to show emotion. It was very much within that other box that our, our initial formations happened. And so I see this as freeing. Okay, I hear you, I hear you Karen, and I feel, I feel your pain. You want the catechism to evolve. That's a condemned heresy, by the way, the evolution of doctrine. But in, let's leave that aside. I understand that. But which parts of the catechism should be knocked out? Which part of Scripture, which books of the Bible would you like to have taken out to make you feel even freer? I can feel free now 
to say exactly what I think and feel. Never felt like that before. It was always guarded. Oh, my goodness. Get some sleep, Susan. Seriously, you, you don't look well. So why don't we turn to Bob over here and see if Bob can get to the point. And one of the challenges I think that we have, and that's why we have this committee and why we're meeting here, is uh, getting over that hump mm -hmm. that people have grown up in a church uh, that may not have been as open to listening. And I think yeah. there's, there's a whole lot of people, myself included, I guess, that uh, have been for years uh, going to church, uh, being spoken to, but not necessarily listened to. And here's a chance to actually be listened to and, and give your opinion on how you think the church can change to accommodate a whole lot of things. Whew. I gotta tell you, Bobby, I'm already done listening. What are you talking about? I mean, this, this, this is torture. And yet all the bishops in the world now, don't forget, don't lose the context. This is what the diocesan meetings are gonna look like. All the bishops of the world are to spend the next two years doing this, what amounts to theological finger painting, <laughs> painting with a straight face. That's the game plan. Sheila. Can you get to the point? The church is the people, and, and we, need, we need to gear it for the people. Right? Mm -hmm. And this generation is different from the last. We have, we have yes. the world is changing. We, we need to accommodate, right? Mm -hmm. How do we get people to come in and feel like, I love this place. I feel warm and welcome here. Mm -hmm. I want to be here. There's people here that I know and love. There are things to share with these people. I will listen to them. I will talk to them. I, I, can, I can share my feelings here. I can go home feeling like, wow, that was fantastic. That is fantastic, Sheila. And I want you to know that you're, you're special. You're special. You are special to me, Sheila. And I will sit in your pew anytime. But I still don't understand what you're talking about. What are you looking for specifically? And if you can't, I guess we'll go to Don. Don, can you get us past the Stuart Smalley talking points, please? What we got to do, we got to keep up with the times. We, not only have we got to keep up with them, if we want to, to revive the church and, and, and pump some new oxygen back into it, we've got to get ahead of the times. <sighs> okay, good. By the way, Don, do you play pickleball? Because maybe that would be something that would meet your needs. Whatever they are, I'm still not sure. I'm sorry, friends. This is just keeps going on and on. It's like a really, really bad Saturday Night Live skit from years ago. I deserve good things. I am entitled to my share of happiness. I refuse to beat myself up. And then there's Mary. Mary, Mary, quite contrary, who's got a few beefs, but once again, pretty short on specifics. But I'm hopeful that in my lifetime, because uh, I'm hoping to live long life, uh, that there will be some meaningful change. And it's unfortunate that we still have, and I will call them factions within the church that want to hold back the change that needs to happen, particularly for our young people. Mm -hmm. Our young people, in many ways, are better than we will ever be mm -hmm. because they are not judgmental. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. You are a button. And I can tell you, you know what? You are a gal with a finger on the pulse of what the kids want. I can see that right away. That's very good. By the way, have you ever heard of the Chart Pilgrimage? La manière la plus accomplie, je trouve, de pouvoir rendre gloire à Dieu. Je trouve c'est trop beau. Un supplément d'âme. La beauté de la, de la liturgie. Le latin, je dire, parle à notre âme. Joyeux. Spirituel. Look at all those thousands of young people going to the Latin Mass and totally connected to the church. How do you suppose that happened? Kind of makes me think, doesn't it, Mary? I don't really see what our church offers young people either. I really don't. They, it, we do not offer them a home that can accept their differences if they have differences. It's unfortunate that our church is a church of no. No, you can't do this. No, you can't do that. No, no, no. 
And that's a perception that has really stuck, unfortunately, that it is a church of no, 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 when it should be a more welcoming space. Oh, no, boy, absolutely. That's a great point. I mean, anytime you can work the word space into, into a meeting like this, that's a win. That's gold. Now, God, God says, thou shalt not. I think he says that something like 10 times in the Decalogue. Well, not, not the, the Ten Commandments, Mary. No, yeah, the Ten Commandments. 10 times, thou shalt not. <laughs> but what does God know about creating welcoming spaces, right? What would he know? For that, for some expertise on welcoming spaces, we need to listen to Mary and Joanne. So until... Um, Rome, the larger Rome, says that, you know what? Jesus is love. Love is love. And we love you, all of you, as you are, where you are, how you are. Until Rome says that, I don't know that we can bring people in. G G Jesus is, is love. And love is love. <laughs> wow, Joanne. Thank you so much for sharing that. Because that, that I get. I understand that. Now, finally, towards the end of this slog, which seems like it was ordered by a judge, some sort of community service to me, by the end of our little video, a guy named Mike finally gets to the point. Probably majority of um, religions, uh, the same-sex marriage is very much a, a debatable topic, but it's it's the way that we have learned to embrace everybody. Uh, they're no different. I mean, it's this not the way. Right here. This, right? this stands out to me a whole lot. This inclusive picture. Yep. I'm sorry, Jessica. Jessica, did you have something to say, sweetheart? What, what was that? Oh, I, yeah. You 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 like the picture, do you? It is nice. It's a nice picture. I think it was done by, uh, I think it was done in Crayola, actually. I'm a special ed teacher, so mm -hmm. this is yeah. this is huge. So you know, if we're going to be inclusive yep. of of all yep. them same sex marriages, right? Is, you know, it is. It's fun. It's nice. But Mike, you you were saying something. Go, go ahead. Continue. You know, it's not it's not our relationship, but we have friends. We have family. I mean, people who are very close. There's no different. Um, uh, you know, we we would just hope that. The religion can see that and value that as well, right? Oh, well, there you have it, friends. After all this crazy, after all the cray-cray, we finally get down to what this is all about. It's all about sodomy. Yes, it is. The church needs to listen up and change her teachings on one of the sins that cries to heaven for vengeance, and then all will be well, you see. This is what synodality is all about. The last thing, the last, <laughs> the last line in the sand that separates the Catholic Church from nearly every other organization in the world. If you want to be a globalist player, you have to remove the stigma attached to homosexual acts. And that, dear friends, is what the Synod on Synodality is going to do. Don't forget, this video was shown to all the little children last Sunday.